Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Banner, and uh, thank you, ESI, for hosting this. And um, for those of us who've been in the solar or other parts of the renewable energy industry for years, there's an expression, a true believer. Anybody who goes above and beyond the call of duty and sticks to a hard job for a long time or braves the elements on a Friday night when they could be doing something else like staying home watching TV or watching the webcast, but instead comes out to a lecture hall Friday night in a what is in Austin considered a, uh, a, a difficult travel condition. You all, you all are true believers. So thanks for being here. I'm going to talk about electricity and how we generate it and how we generate it today, and some of the ways we're going to be generating it increasingly in the future, which means green energy, which is another word for renewable energy. I'll be talking specifically about Austin, but first let's just go over what do we mean by renewable or green electricity. There's basically four ways that electricity can be made that are called renewable and green. The oldest is hydroelectric power. Wind is the energy source which throughout the world today is growing at a faster rate than any other manner of generating electricity. And it's also right now about the most economical new renewable energy source. Solar energy, there's basically two ways of converting sunlight to electricity. I'll be talking about both. And this slide, in fact, shows uh, a very large solar thermal power plant in the Mojave Desert. Now, the fourth category of renewable energy is really a catch-all. We call it bioenergy. And it's a very broad classification. But essentially, it means any way of using stuff that grows or has grown to produce electricity. And it consists of a wide variety of things. I'll be talking about a few of them toward the end. But the general term is bioenergy. And before we go any further, though, on the new sources, let's take a look at where we are today. If we look at Austin right now, Austin Energy is a municipally owned electric power company which serves the city and some of the surrounding areas. Um, we generate our electricity by and large from these four sources. The largest single one, coal, and our coal-fired power plant is jointly owned with the LCRA, Lower Colorado River Authority, which um, began as a river authority and now Although it still operates hydro plants, it's largely using thermal power plants, coal and natural gas. Austin Energy shares a power plant called Fayette, which if you drive from here along 71 East on the way to Houston, you'll see the stacks on, your, on the north side of Route 71. LaGrange is the town it's in. It's called Fayette, and we burn coal there to produce about 35, 36% of our total electricity. We own a share, it's actually a 16% share of a nuclear plant, South Texas Nuclear. And we've been generating power there for more than 10 years. And that's about 30 or so percent. We have currently three power stations in the city of Austin. The Sand Hill is the newest, that's out toward the airport on Falwell Road, or Falwell Lane, off um, Ben White going north. Uh, just a little bit east of the airport. Uh, we have the Holly Street Power Plant. Of course, everybody knows about that. You also probably all know it's scheduled to be closed. Uh, two phases, the first phase closing in the end of 2005, the next the end of 2007. Uh, but our largest gas-fired power plant is Decker, which is really just north of the Travis County Exposition Center. And between those three plants, Sand Hill, Decker, and Holly, we generate roughly 31% or so of our electric power. Uh, we're getting, I think as, as Jay Banner just said, uh, we, we're only getting a fraction of a percent of our total electricity from all the renewable sources together five years ago. Now we're up to about 3%, and within a year we should be up over 5%. 
and what I'll be talking about as what those technologies are for producing electricity that are renewable um, and what they are, how they work, roughly how much they cost compared to conventional sources, some of the difficulties in using them and exploiting those resources in our ability to draw from the wind, from the sun, from things that grow to make power. But before I go on, I just want to show you a slide we're very proud of. This, uh, as you can see, compares Austin Energy to a bunch of other utilities. And the bars here represent the amount of electricity that each of these utilities has produced in the most recent year that it's been recorded from renewable energy sources through a program of customer choice. All the utilities on this list have programs, and the term for these programs is green pricing. Green pricing very simply means a utility gives its customers the opportunity to express their preference for how they want the utility to make electricity. And generally, since renewable sources cost, in many cases, a little bit more than conventional power, those customers who want their utility to generate more power from renewable sources are willing to pay a little bit more, and the utility gives them an opportunity to pay a little bit more. And thereby, it's a great opportunity. But people do it. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people throughout the country are now choosing voluntarily to pay a little bit more on their electric bill with the understanding that their utility will produce an increasing amount of its electricity from renewable sources. And this slide is to show that Austin, because of its customers, and we have over 7,000 customers who've chosen green over conventional, which means they're paying, many of them are paying a little bit more. Uh, it means our customers have led the way to creating the most successful green energy program in the country way above number two and number three on the list. Let's face it, we're in Texas. It's okay to boast, as long as it's true. Okay, now a little bit more about Austin Energy. Again, we're publicly owned. Everybody who uh, lives in the city of Austin um, is essentially a shareholder in Austin Energy. They elect a city council. The members of the city council and the mayor together are the board of directors of Austin Energy. And they establish long-range goals. Among the goals are how we're going to produce our energy in the future. A very long-range goal, which is a goal for the year 2020, is we want to receive, by the year 2020, 20% 20 of our total electricity from new renewable energy sources. In addition to that, they've established a goal for one of those renewable energy sources for solar, which is a very ambitious goal considering where we are today. And as we say here, it's to increase by a factor of 50 the amount of electricity we receive from solar power. And those are the current sources, nuclear, coal, natural gas, and renewables. And the two pie charts show, of course, where we are today and where we expect to be in about 16 years. I'm sure you all know this because you've all probably attended the uh, lecture here on air pollution, air quality. Uh, the two chemicals produced by burning any hydrocarbon fuel, coal, natural gas, oil, gasoline, that are of main concern are carbon dioxide, which is the greenhouse gas, which is leading to climate change, global warming, a great concern for the whole world, and the other chemical, nitrogen oxides, which, as you're all aware, I'm sure, is a precursor of ozone. Ozone way up in the stratosphere is natural and it's good. It's necessary, in fact. But the ozone here stays close to the ground where we can breathe it. And that's not good. And in fact, Austin may very well move into a non-attainment status as classified by the federal government's EPA. And that's not good at all. And we're trying to avoid that. 
one way to avoid being classified as a non-attainment area. And when that happens, by the way, you, you uh, have to spend a lot of money on various tests. And you also have, have a chance that a city will lose its federal funding for transportation and roads. And, of course, nobody wants that. So uh, we're concerned. The utility industry is only part of the contribution of nitrogen oxides. Most nitrogen oxides are produced by vehicles. So everybody who drives a gasoline or diesel burning vehicle of any kind or flies in an airplane, of course, because they also burn uh, fuels which produce nitrogen oxides, um, we're all contributing to that problem and we can all start to help solve the problem by moving away toward other energy sources which do not produce nitrogen oxides, which means things other than hydrocarbon fuels. Renewable energy for power generation is one of those options. Okay, I'm going to try to address as many of these questions as, as I can today. What is renewable energy? Very simply, an energy source which does not deplete, does not get used up, or gets replenished at the same rate as it's used, and does not pollute the air. I'll talk about how each of these sources work as I address them. I'll wrap up toward the end with how much they cost relative to what we're now paying to produce energy from coal, natural gas. Question, of course, is how, to what extent can renewable sources replace current energy sources, hydrocarbon fuels especially, and especially in Texas. What's the potential here? And this last one is sort of an effort to address a, uh, an objection raised by people who are essentially don't believe it's possible for renewables to make a real contribution after they've learned that renewables really aren't that much more expensive and in some cases are already competitive, they'll usually come up with an, op with, with an objection, which is, oh, they take up far too much land. You'd have, to, you'd have to cover half of Texas with solar panels to produce enough electricity for homes or something like that. And uh, I'm going to be asking the question, suppose you really wanted to do the measurement and figure out how much land would each of these sources we're talking about take to really replace a third of Austin's total electric requirements? And that'll be the final slide. So let's go back to the sources, hydroelectricity. We have hydro in Texas, but it makes a very, very tiny percent of the electricity used. Uh, just to give you some sense of scale, the LCRA that I mentioned before, which operates the hydro plants on the Colorado River, the lower Colorado River, has about 300 megawatts, a little less than 300 megawatts of hydroelectricity. The total state of Texas has over 70,000 megawatts of electric generating capacity. Those of you with calculators who want to figure out the percentage, go ahead. It's really small. Uh, this slide over here, shows the, okay, you can't, well, you see the animation here. Um, how does hydroelectricity work? It's really quite simple. We impound water behind a dam, create high pressure. High pressure water is allowed to flow through a tube called a penstock. It turns the veins of a hydroelectric turbine. You could think of it almost like wind blowing on a pinwheel. The turbine is forced to uh, drive an electric generator. An electric generator, in very simple terms, is a magnetic field, electromagnetic field, carried on a sh uh, shaft which turns inside coils of wire. That's how we make electricity. And the generator here is turned by a shaft connected to the hydro turbine. I'm not going to say anything more about hydro because there really is not a great deal of expansion possibility for hydro in Texas. There is elsewhere in the world, but let's focus on Texas. Well, there's a tremendous expansion potential for wind energy in Texas and throughout the world. Wind is, is the most economical renewable energy source, which has tremendous future potential, especially in Texas. 
Wind turbines over the years have gotten bigger, more efficient, more reliable, less expensive per unit, less expensive to maintain. All very positive things. As a result, as I said before, it's the fastest growing electric generation source. Generally, large wind turbines are erected in clusters. They call them wind farms or here in Texas, wind ranches. Um, typical size. This gives you a sense of the size. You see the, the, the two white hats up here? Those are the hard hats of the guys in the, uh, in the generator housing. A wind turbine today, modern large wind turbine, is about the height of the Texas Tower here at the university. The towers themselves are 200 to 250 feet high. The blades, and most of them have three blades as shown here, the length of each blade on a modern large-scale wind turbine, 100 to 120 feet. And they're getting even bigger for some of the large, large units which will be deployed offshore. A wind turbine of that size over the course of a year will generate roughly the same amount of energy as 300 to 350 average Austin homes. That's a lot of juice. I just put this slide in to show all wind turbines are not three-bladed horizontal axis, but most of them are. There's been a lot of work on this design, which most people would call it an egg beater style. It's actually got a name, Darius Rotor. It was invented by a gentleman named Darius. And there's work, and there's still work going on on vertical axis machines, but by and large, the technology seems to have converged on a three-bladed, large horizontal axis wind turbine. Not much to say here. That's how they work. Uh, but this, this, is, uh, this is actually, there's an important point to make here. As the wind turbines get larger, the design of the machine is such that the blades turn at a slower and slower rate of revolutions per minute. And the reason is that they want to keep the blade as efficient as possible and they want to keep the tip speed, that is the speed of the very end of the blade, within certain limits. That's usually about 150 to 200 miles an hour. So as it gets longer and longer, to keep it within that speed limit, you've got to turn slower. The wind turbines in California, which were put up in the late 80s, early 90s, were typically about 100 kilowatts. Today's wind turbines, such as the one I just described, are uh, 1,500 to 2,000 kilowatts, 20 times as large. The blades of those California machines were turning at 100 RPM or more. Today's wind turbines mostly turn at about 20 RPM. One thing about that that's very good is it, it's much easier for birds to see them and avoid them. And we want to protect birds. There's been a lot of complaints in California about wind turbines killing birds. In Texas, it doesn't seem to be a problem for several reasons, one of which is the designs of the machines have changed, slower rotating blades. We've moved away from the lattice towers uh, that they used in California. And you know, all know what I mean by lattice towers, sort of looks like transmission tower. It gave the birds a place to roost and then sweep down for their prey. They didn't see the blades, especially those blades turning at 100 or more RPM. So, and on top of that, we've learned not to place wind turbines in migratory bird paths because we look into it before they place the wind turbines. These are the counties in Texas which have wind development. And the first, let's see if I can get this one working. Okay. This is pretty much where it started. Well, actually, it started at Culberson County. The first Texas wind turbines were there. Most of the development has been in um, Upton and Pecos. And lately, there's been wind development up here near Amarillo. And these counties here are getting, they're, they're the new wind, wind rich areas. Um, Upton County and Pecos County have had such extensive wind development that they actually outstripped the ability of the local transmission system to move the energy from the wind farms to the rest of the transmission system. 
The transmission builders are catching up. But while they're catching up, some of the wind turbines have to be taken offline for a period of hours when the winds are so strong that if they allowed them to generate, they would burn out the wires or the transmission system or switches or other parts of the transmission system, substation equipment. And we can't allow that to happen, of course. That's very expensive stuff. So they've had to take them out of service. Some wind turbines in each wind farm during the times when the winds are particularly strong. Uh, that's a situation that's called uh, transmission congestion and curtailment. The two C's, which are really very unfortunate. When you think about it, once you've paid for a wind turbine, having to take it out of service when the winds are strong is the same thing as throwing handfuls of money up in the air and letting the wind carry it away. So that's a problem. People have heard about it. It's being addressed. But uh, the ability of the transmission line construction industry to keep up with the development of wind turbines is very important. And it's really, it's one of the factors which has essentially kept the wind industry advancing at a slower rate than it would like to. And then a lot of customers would like it to. But building transmission lines inherently takes a lot of time. So let's move away from wind to the second source, solar energy. As I mentioned before, there are two ways of converting sunlight to electricity. Solar thermal power plants concentrate sunlight using mirrors, in this case parabolic mirrors that are called parabolic troughs. The cross section is a parabola. They reflect the light, they concentrate the light. Here's another way to concentrate light. It's also a parabola, but it's not a trough. It's in the shape of a dish. And let's go back to the, to the trough because there are far more of these than there are of the dishes. The light is concentrated by the shape of the cross section of, of the mirror onto a tube. The tube heats up to about 750 to 800 degrees Fahrenheit. It carries a special fluid which moves that heat down the tubes from one row to another. And there's lots of rows. This is a helicopter view of a solar thermal power plant that was built by Luz Corporation in the Mojave Desert. And to give you a sense of how big it is, there you go. Those who did the animation, thanks. This, this basically uh, saves me a thousand words. <laughs> okay, um, just a couple of more words about solar thermal. Um, we don't have it to a large scale yet in Texas. They do in California, the Mojave Desert's in California. It requires arid climates, very arid conditions, so that the sunlight can be concentrated, can be reflected. The other solar technology, I said there were two. One is converting light to, to heat, high temperature heat, and using that heat to drive a steam turbine effectively, or another form of heat engine. The other source, which works equally well in humid climates or arid climates, is photovoltaics, solar cells, which are made of semiconductor material. Most of them are made from silicon in a process which really resembles the beginning of the chip making process. So we know all about that here in Austin. A photovoltaic panel acts like a pump for electrons that is energized by sunlight. The flow of electrons is proportional to the intensity of the sunlight that falls on the panel. I'm not going to talk a lot about how they're made other than what I've said, which is the process resembles the beginning of chip making. There's a lot of different technologies now for making solar photovoltaics. The important thing is to recognize that even though they are relatively expensive compared to utility electricity, they already make a lot of sense and are truly the most economical solution to situations where you want power in modest amounts and there's no wire yet. For example, the classic example is a light in a park or a light anywhere where there's no utility line. 
the cost of a rechargeable battery, and in this case, the rechargeable battery is right up here in this housing, to energize that light is battery is recharged by the solar panel. We've got these in Austin at Schroeder Park and at uh, a couple of other parks. They're all over the world now. Another example, pumping water for irrigation or for livestock in areas where there's no wire. The cost of the wire, the cost of the transmission line or distribution line and the poles to support it will often be more expensive than providing the electricity for the pump from an array of solar panels. Now, these particular panels are supported on racks which actually track the sun. They follow the sun throughout the day. They make more power than if they were stationary. As solar panels have become less expensive, and they have over the 50 years that they've been made, and the solar industry does go back to 1954. This is the 50th anniversary of the invention of the solar photovoltaic cell. They become less expensive as we've learned how to manufacture them more efficiently with less material and faster. And now they are being used as a substitute for roofing tile on this house. Here's one of about 30 solar photovoltaic systems on roofs in Austin. This one is on the Wild Basin, which is uh, off uh, Loop 360 north of 2244 Bee Caves Road, just head north. It's on the right. Uh, beautiful wildlife preserve, great hiking trails, a nature center shown here getting part of its power from a six kilowatt photovoltaic system. Uh, six kilowatts, to give you a sense, would be about the size of a system that would provide most of the energy for your typical Austin home. Uh, requires about 700 square feet of panel. And this here is only one half. The, the, the other side of the roof, which would be over here, has an equal number of solar panels. These boxes are part of the picture because they're part of the power system. Solar photovoltaic panels produce direct current electricity. These devices here are called inverters. They convert the direct current to alternating current at the right voltage to put it into the building or into the power grid, and they synchronize automatically with the utility grid. So every photovoltaic system will consist of an array of solar panels and inverters and, of course, the wires to get them down and some switches. It's really fairly simple. When you look at a system, there aren't all that many components. And we're going, to be see a lot, we're going to see a lot more photovoltaic systems going in Austin starting this year because the city will be providing incentives to homeowners and other building owners who want to buy photovoltaics. And I'll be glad to answer questions about that later. Okay, it makes an awful lot of sense if you're going to put photovoltaic panels on a building to get a second use rather than just making electricity. And this building here in Zurich, Switzerland, uh, is a great example of making dual use of the solar panels. And you all see what they're doing. They're shading the windows like awnings, as well as producing electricity. Well, we're doing the same thing here. That's the Austin Convention Center. You can see this if you go to the corner of Trinity and I think it's 4th, which is the street that goes across the north side of the new convention center between the convention center and the new hotel. Now, there's two kinds of glass panels here. There's blue panels, which just filter the sunlight. But there's also, next to every, on the outside of every blue panel, there's a photovoltaic panel. Here's a close-up making electricity. And this is a, a beautiful system. It really, it, it shows the ability to use the panels to make electricity, to filter the sunlight. These panels actually allow the light, some of the light to pass through these scribe lines, which are part of the processing of the panel, and to get into the building. So when the light gets in the building, it's filtered. It's very diffuse. It creates a very pleasant ambiance in the uh, arcade of the arcade. I guess it's a, a solarium, really, of the convention center. And let's turn to the fourth source. We've talked about hydro, about wind, about solar, 
bioenergy. The oldest bioenergy plant that makes electricity is a wood-burning power plant. And the wood industry, the paper industry, lots of lumber mills have been using the waste material from the tree that's not used as part of the, the wood product or the pulp process, the basically scrap material, as a boiler fuel, that's one form of bioenergy. Other forms of bioenergy use other parts of plants or crops, essentially, that are not harvested, that are not used for food or fiber, and would otherwise be essentially waste material, which in some cases is a problem to dispose of, such as rice hulls, using that as a feedstock either for a power plant or in some cases for making alcohol, such as ethanol fuels. That's another form of bioenergy. There's a third form, which is actually finding a crop that grows really fast in your climate, growing that crop specifically to harvest it for a feedstock for a power plant or to make into alcohol fuel or to turn into a gas, which then is the fuel for a power plant. Now, these are called dedicated energy crops. And one type that's been investigated for Texas is switchgrass. There are others as well. This, however, is really still pretty new. There's a lot of work that still has to be done to make this work out economically. On the other hand, a byproduct of the material that is contained in the sewers sanitary sewers. It's called sludge when it, gets, when it gets to a sewage treatment plant. And I'm glad all of you have already eaten. Uh, I'm not going to talk a great deal about this stuff, but sludge has to be disposed of. And in, in Austin, it all goes from all the sewage treatment plants. It gets piped to this plant, which is called Hornsby Bend in East Austin. Hornsby Bend has about eight of these devices, they're called biodigesters. They use a natural process to remove the volatile material from the sludge. The volatile material, it turns out, is methane and carbon dioxide. Well, the carbon dioxide is going to go into the air anyway. The methane, however, we don't want the methane to go in the air. Methane is the major constituent of natural gas fuel. It's a fuel. They're capturing it from these eight biodigesters. They're called sludge digesters. They're capturing it and using it to generate power in a modified diesel style engine. Eventually, we're going to see more of the waste product from cows going into such digesters. And it's going to make methane, and we're going to use the methane for power. This is already done extensively in Western Europe especially Germany and Denmark. It's starting to be done in the dairy country of Wisconsin. And it turns out Texas has a couple of counties that have an awful lot of cows, like 60 to 100,000. So we're going to get kilowatts from cows. Once we get the methane, it's the same process. We can use it as a fuel for an engine generator. Another source of methane is a sanitary landfill. And this picture here was taken at Sunset Farms in Austin, the Sunset Farms landfill, northeast Austin, uh, on Giles Lane, which runs north off 290 East. There's a landfill there, and we're getting enough electricity by collecting the methane from wells that are placed about 60 feet apart in the landfill. And this drawing here shows a little schematic diagram of how we turn that methane into electricity. We've got to draw it up, so create a vacuum to suck it up through the perforated pipe, compress it into an engine generator, which looks like a diesel engine, drives an electric generator. So we're getting power from the decomposition of garbage. Let's turn to one of those questions. How much does this stuff all cost? And I want to start here. A baseline comparison could be coal, because coal is... And this is only the fuel cost. This does not include the capital cost of the conventional sources, natural gas or coal. 
as you can see, already there's a big difference between what we pay for coal per unit of energy produced and what we pay for natural gas. But we're not looking at building any more coal-fired power plants in Austin because of the environmental concerns. However, most new power is either going to be generated by building more natural gas plants, and you can see natural gas starts here, and this is all cents per kilowatt hour. And these are, again, just the fuel costs. So we see natural gas has a very wide range. And that's because it's a very volatile price. We've paid anywhere from $2 a unit to $9 or $10 per unit. And we see the price of the electricity from burning natural gas in our natural gas plants ranges from 5 up to, uh, well, it could be as high as 15 at times depending on what we have to pay. And these are the renewable sources I talked about. Now, let's start here with the, the good news, of course, is wind is already at a price which is competitive with gas if you just look at the cost of the energy. And landfill methane is also pretty competitive. Biomethane from other sources, such as the cows, where we need to build the digester, is going to be a little bit more. But still, these three sources are all in this range. Now, wind, of course, has certain characteristics which really make it an unusual comparison to the cost of electricity from a natural gas-fired power plant. Wind is intermittent. Wind is not controllable by people. It's controlled by God. God dispatches the wind farm, so to speak. And it's somewhat predictable, a little bit ahead of time, but in long term, you really can't say for sure how much wind energy you're going to get at a particular hour when you might need the energy the most. So those are the drawbacks to wind, which sort of compensate a little bit for its low price. The important thing here is we are learning through experience with wind how to dispatch and operate our power plants and our whole power system to make the most use of this resource, which is inherently low cost, but has these three drawbacks. It's intermittent, it's not controllable, and it's not terribly predictable. By the way, those, those problems do not exist for landfill methane. It's steady or for bioenergy. Now let's turn to the two forms of solar, solar thermal, and photovoltaics. Number one, let's not do a comparison really between the very expensive photovoltaics and these sources because it's got a unique attribute to it. You can put photovoltaics on a building so it's really providing end use retail electricity. Retail electricity in Austin is about three times the cost or three times the value as wholesale, that is, electricity at the generating station. These are all wholesale costs. All these are wholesale technologies. Photovoltaics is retail. In addition, as technologies improve, as the production of photovoltaic panels and inverters gets better, we learn how to do it better, we learn, and, and it's been coming down in cost, as those technologies continue to improve and we learn how to make them at a lower cost, this whole bar is going to shift downwards, as will solar thermal, that is, making solar from reflecting sunlight or concentrating sunlight. So these two, I would say, are still evolving technologies which will move downward, but this gives you a pretty good sense of the relative costs of the energy sources I've talked about. And to wrap things up, that question, how much land does it take? Okay, we measure land in acres, but here in Texas we measure land in football fields. It turns out a football field is, is roughly an acre. So for each of these three technologies, solar photovoltaics, uh, wind, and for the bioenergy here, I chose the dedicated energy crop, which is really the most land intensive we showed to produce one-third from each of these sources of Austin's total electricity requirements, how much land does it take? And what percentage is that land of Travis County? 
Now, a couple of points I want to make here. Clearly, solar photovoltaics, even though it's most expensive, takes up by far the least amount of land. But this really doesn't take up land at all. You put this on a roof or you build it in the airspace over a parking area or over anything and you're not consuming the land. You're shading the land or you're putting it on area of a roof which would otherwise not be used. So really, this is almost zero. The wind energy here, the land required for wind farms, this is not just the land occupied by the turbine foundation and the substation and the transformer. This is all the space between them. Most of this land can still be used by the rancher or the farmer. The one technology which really does take a lot of land is bioenergy if you're growing a crop specifically to make electricity. And that does consume. So the bottom line here is that for solar and wind, the argument that they take up too much space is simply, it's not true. And to wrap up, the advantages of these renewable sources, clearly environmentally friendly, becoming increasingly cost effective. Some are there already. Some it will take a few more years to get there. We could serve natural resources and renewable energy doesn't burn a fuel. It doesn't continue our dependence and our vulnerability to forces we cannot control. We're already importing more than half of our oil. We don't import half of our natural gas, which is the, the main power plant fuel for the future, it appears, but we do import 10% today. Most of it's from Canada. But we are outstripping the ability of the domestic natural gas producers within the continental U.S. to produce from their existing wells and wells they're developing. Every year, we will become a little bit more dependent on imports, and those imports will be from other continents coming in as a liquid natural gas which means it's going to be expensive. But most important of all, we don't control, and therefore we are, as if we become more dependent on natural gas, becoming dependent on something over which we have no control, the price may go up, may go down, may go up, as it has. With renewable sources, we know what it will cost up front because they're largely capital costs. And the final line is, is our goals are for renewable to be an increasing share of Austin's electricity and a big part of Austin's future. And with that, I would like to entertain questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. I'm sure Mark will be happy to answer questions uh, for both people here and for the uh, audience that's online. Uh, before we start, the one thing I want to mention at the beginning that I to is that um, Mark drives an electric vehicle, so he drove a day for me. He parked out on uh, 24th Street. I'll be happy to show any of you after you start some questions. Those of you who think, uh, and this is, not a, this is not a hybrid vehicle, this is a fully electric vehicle. And it's really cool. You'll be driving one time. A lot of people think that, uh, you know, electric electric powered cars don't have enough pump or power or anything. Then we gave it for a spin, we went out off to uh, Dean Keaton, and within four seconds I was breaking the speed limit. <laughs> <laughs> it really has some really good effect to it. Just because it's electric doesn't mean it's like this. Somebody should have the hell uh, I actually got a speeding ticket my first week after I got the car. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll start with some uh, questions from the audience. Go ahead and, go ahead and choose them. Okay, uh, this young, young gentleman here in the red shirt was e eagerly asking. In Austin, can, will they actually pay you to put more energy into the system than you take in Okay, the question was, in Austin, will we actually pay for electricity? I guess you're specifically referring to homes or other buildings which have solar panels on, on the building and produce electricity. Uh, this is how it works under the current arrangement. And by the way, I should say this may change in the future because we're looking into a possible changes. It's only possible. Currently, at this moment, our residential electric meters will reverse direction during those times of the day when a solar power system on the roof 
of a building, well, at least of, of a home, produces more energy than the home uses. By reversing direction, it's subtracting kilowatt hours off the register. So at the end of the month, the register will essentially reflect the difference between what you used and what you produced with your solar power system. That's called net metering or net billing. And we do it inherently because the meters, by nature, reverse direction. So we're not paying a, a check for the electricity produced. We're essentially giving a full credit for every unit of electricity produced by your private solar system. So that's, that's what we're doing now. Yes? And is, it, is that essentially how you're going to calculate the uh, percentage uh, that, that you're going to increase your participation in renewables? Well, most of the uh, renewable energy now is coming from wind and from bioenergy. A, a very, very tiny fraction, well under 1%, comes from solar. Uh, and we expect solar, although there will be a lot of solar systems compared, if you look at the energy produced compared to what we're getting from the wind farms, I think we're going to continue to see wind as the largest single source. And I, I guess I didn't say this before, but currently of the renewable sources in Austin, which make up about 3% of our total, two-thirds of that is coming from wind and about one-third is coming from landfill methane. Um, and that doesn't leave very much, but a tiny, a well under 1% comes from solar. We expect the solar to increase, but still, in absolute energy terms, it'll still be largely wind and, and various bioenergy sources, simply because they're so much less expensive. Um, so that's, we'll, we'll see some solar, but it will continue to make up, we think, a, a small percentage relative to wind and bioenergy. Yes. With the green power program, are you able to purchase enough renewable energy for all the people who buy it, especially that continues to, to grow? Okay, the question was, with our green choice program, which is our, our form of green pricing, will we be able to continue to, to obtain as much green energy, as much, as much renewably produced energy as our customers are using as the customers increase? And it's been increasing. And the answer is, yes, we have to. We're, we're obligated to. And the way we do it is every so often, and it's been every two years, but we're going to start doing this every year, we solicit proposals for developers who want to develop new renewable energy sources. And it's open to any renewable source, wind, solar, hydro. Geothermal I didn't talk about today because we don't have any yet, but if there were geothermal, it would be open to that as well. So we, we do a public solicitation every so often. It'll probably be every year from now on. We get lots of proposals. We've done these three times, and over the three times we've done it, we've received about 40 proposals, about a dozen each time, sometimes more. We review them, and we make awards for long-term contracts to buy the energy produced by those renewable developers. We've got now um, in operation two wind contracts and two landfill methane contracts. Two more wind contracts have been signed or will be signed very soon, and those will turn into new wind farms. So to answer you, it's, this is a very long question. This is a long answer to a very short question. We are obligated to continually increase our supply of renewable energy into the system so that we can show at the end of every year we have produced or bought as much, at least as much, as we've sold. And one thing I should point out, we're not telling anyone that your personal electrons coming into your house are coming from that wind farm out there in West Texas. That can't happen. It's impossible. But what we do assure you, because the way the utility grid works is it's really impossible to trace any particular customer's electricity from any particular power plant. It's a grid. Everything feeds the grid. We put it in all over the place in Texas, and we take it out. We can meter how much we put in from every source, and we do very accurately. We can meter how much we take out. We know exactly how many green kilowatt hours, the way we measure electricity, all of our green choice customers use every year, 
and we know how many green kilowatt hours every one of our wind farms and landfill methane projects and solar installations put into the grid. So we know how to balance them. And we're, every year we'll be adding additional sources. And again, when we add, we're not taking from what exists already. We're doing a purchase of power agreement to enable a developer to build a new wind farm, a new landfill methane project, a new solar facility. So we're creating new energy, so to speak. Thank you for the question, and I hope that wasn't too long-winded an answer. Let's go, uh, let's, let's go online. Let's go online. Okay. There are a lot of questions online. Thanks, everyone, out there for your participation. I don't think we're actually going to be able to answer all of these questions tonight, but we will answer them eventually. Um, so hang in there. Well, I'll be here all night if you want. At least be getting an email answer from us for some reason. So this question comes from Shannon. She asks, why don't we use offshore wind turbines? Are there legal reasons? Okay, uh, why don't we use offshore wind turbines? Well, offshore wind turbines are, be, are being used in uh, England, in Germany, in Denmark, and Texas right now doesn't have any yet. That doesn't mean we won't in the future. Right now, the wind developers have chosen to develop a part of Texas which used to be not only offshore but under the water, West Texas and the Panhandle. Uh, they've determined that those are areas that are more economical to generate, uh, to place wind farms and to generate power. So they haven't chosen to go offshore yet. But the General Land Office, which has jurisdiction, uh, I think out to 12, 12 miles offshore, intends to encourage developers to develop the offshore wind resource. So it hasn't happened yet. Shanna, I think, is that one of the Shannon? Yes. Hasn't happened yet, but that doesn't mean it won't in the future. Greg asks, Mr. Kapner, how resistant are solar panels to Texas weather, especially heat and hail? Well, heat's not a problem. Hail, they, they need to, um, to be able to be sold on the market and to receive what's called a UL listing, Underwriters Laboratory listing, and to, uh, to meet the requirements of buyers, solar photovoltaic panels are subjected to a hail test. And I've seen one of these hail tests. They actually fire a one-inch diameter hail ball at 60 miles an hour, which they tell me is the terminal velocity of, of hail. They fire them at panels, at a sample of every manufacturer's panel. And if the panel breaks, the manufacturer is not allowed to sell that type of panel until they figure out how to make it stronger. So they are highly hail resistant. That doesn't mean that every single solar panel is going to survive every single hailstorm, but by and large, and we've have a, we have quite a few solar panels out there for many years. We've had very, very few solar panels damaged by hail, and heat is not a problem at all. They have to withstand the elements. Okay, uh, let's see, some more questions. Yes. Yes, uh, the question was, uh, does Austin Energy have grant programs for solar in schools? And we actually intend to uh, place several dozen, it, it might be in the neighborhood of 20 solar panel systems on schools in the Austin area over the coming years. Uh, and this will, th these will be done by Austin Energy as part of the community owned since we, we are community owned, these will be community owned. So they're, they're producing power. Uh, it's being paid for by, by Austin Energy. It's a, a community resource. So there'll be somewhere in the order of 20 schools in the coming years. And I think now there are, I think it's three schools already have solar panels, which, which Austin Energy provided, including yours. So thank you. Yes. You showed the graph that showed the cost of producing energy, but did not include infrastructure costs? Is that correct? Okay, well, I, I should point out, it did not include the capital cost of the power plants for coal or for gas. The other sources, in fact, the cost is the capital cost by and large. The solar, the wind, and the bioenergy, those were the capital costs 
per unit of energy produced. If you were to compare the cost of the energy, if you were going to build up a new coal power plant or mm -hmm. a new uh, natural gas plant, um, and, and you were to spread that payment of the infrastructure over 20 years or something, how would the price of the kilowatt hour compare? Okay, well, since coal has a rather high capital cost relative to natural gas, new, new, a new coal-fired power plant costs more than double what a new natural gas fire power plant costs per unit. Uh, it would increase the coal number, it would almost double it actually. Uh, it would increase the gas number but not all that much because the gas number is already high due to the fuel. And for natural gas fire power plants, the cost of the gas is the lion's share of the cost of the electricity. For coal, it's more 50-50, more or less, and for renewable sources, the capital cost is, for the most part, the cost. So the answer is it'll make a, a bigger difference for coal than it would for natural gas. Yes? Um, I have a question about the uh, natural energy in a really broad sense, maybe a global sense, or at least in this country. Um, what do you think is the biggest challenge in growing the industry? Is it um, efficient technology or creating awareness, or, or what do you think the biggest challenge is? Okay, the question is, this is a very broad philosophical question. What's the biggest challenge to growing the whole renewable energy industry? Is that correct? Wow, we could be here all night trying to answer this one, but it's uh, largely, well, part of it is technology. And, and here, you know, as I mentioned, especially for solar, we know the technologies are getting better, less expensive. We've seen it happen with wind already, and that's why wind has just taken off in recent years, very recent years. I mean, just the last five years, we've seen just explosive growth in wind. Solar is, is still expensive relative to conventional sources, but it's also growing very rapidly. It's just, it's still a much smaller number. In general, I would say the, reason, the, the obstacles to more rapid growth for the entire renewable energy industry, or all the industries which make up renewable energy, it's partially technology, it's partially public knowledge. I mean, um, this, this is a great opportunity for people to, to learn both from, from Michael Osborne's book, which I hope you all got and I hope you all read, and from the discussion here. This is a great opportunity for everybody here not only to increase their own awareness, but to tell your friends what you've learned. And that's one of the most important things in the renewable energy industry is getting the public to understand that this is real. For many years, in fact, it's still true to a large extent, the renewable energy industry has been marginalized by the conventional energy industry. And I realize I'm really treading on eggshells here because this is Texas and <laughs> a lot of folks are in the conventional industry. And, and we're in the chemistry building, which is next to the geology building, which is not all that far from the petrochemical engineering, petroleum engineering building. So, and of course, the university the whole university system and public school systems in general in Texas get a fair degree of their funding, although it's a shrinking amount, from, the oil, from oil royalties and natural gas royalties. So I'm really treading on, on thin ice here talking about conventional energy industry has tended over the years to, marginal, to try to marginalize renewables by saying they'll never amount to anything and just don't pay all that much attention to it. Well, we're trying to counter that with facts and with public awareness. And the industry itself is countering that by making equipment, wind turbines, solar panels, solar thermal systems, bioenergy systems, making them, continuing to refine them, make them more reliable, make them less expensively, and offer them at a price which is increasingly competitive. Once more, just to repeat, it's happened already with wind, and that's why wind is just taking off. It's going to happen increasingly with every other renewable source as they approach the point where they are indeed truly competitive with conventional energy sources. 
So that's, that's the best that I could do at this point, answering a very, very broad philosophical question. Let's take a question up here. Yes. Oh, I guess I sort of have a two-part question. I was just wondering how the, what the total demand looks like for energy in Austin. Is it growing every year or is it stable? And then secondly, how does conservation and our efforts to promote conservation, how cost-effective is that in relation to renewables? Okay, the first question was, is Austin's electricity demand growing? It sure grew a lot in the 90s, especially in the late 90s, up to 2000. Since 2000, it's been really pretty flat. Our total sales each year for the last three, four years have hardly changed from the previous year. Uh, it's a factor of the economy. The second question was, yeah. oh, okay, how, how cost effective is conservation compared to renewables? Conservation, I, I prefer to call it energy efficiency as opposed, well, which means the same thing really as conservation. But sometimes people get the impression conservation means doing without. It means taking shorter showers or cold showers or turning your thermostat um, way up so the air conditioner doesn't come on much and sweating in the summer and freezing in the winter. Well, we prefer energy efficiency, which means making your buildings lose less heat in the winter and gain less heat in the summer architecturally and investing in more efficient air conditioning equipment and lighting and motors and other things. So let's just call it efficiency. Efficiency is always the most cost effective thing to do first. It's more cost effective than building new power plants or burning more fuel. And it's also more cost effective than any renewable source. Invest in efficiency first as far as it can go in a practical sense and then look at renewable energy sources. And this is especially true for solar photovoltaics. If a homeowner has a choice between investing $1,000 to upgrade either their air conditioning or the envelope of the house, which is just a technical word for the walls and the roof and the insulation and the windows, shading, solar screens, for example, um, or putting $1,000 into a solar photovoltaic system, first put the $1,000 into efficiency, and then put the next $1,000 into efficiency. Do everything which makes good sense for efficiency, and then once you've done all that, then think about photovoltaics. It just makes more sense. It's almost a no-brainer. You want to put the money where it does the most good. Efficiency will always come first. That's a question up here. I'd like to know more about your car and, and where is it? Did you buy it? Is it leased? Does, has it manufactured? Okay, it's my own personal car. It's a Geo Metro converted by a gentleman in Houston who does it as a hobby. He's now 82 years old and he's still doing them. He does five or six cars a year. It's um, a conversion is not a religious experience. It's a, a conversion of a conventional vehicle. They take out the engine. They take out most of the drivetrain except for the gearbox. They usually use the gearbox. And they put in a motor, a, an electronic speed controller, which basically regulates as you step on the pedal. It's no longer a gas pedal, just a throttle, how much energy goes to the motor. And a battery pack, which is really big. And if you like to step out afterwards, you can see them all. So that's an electric car conversion. In the future, there will be factory-built, battery-powered, all-electric cars competing with hybrids and conventional cars. And the difference is an all-electric car, you plug it in, and it gets its electricity from the utility grid. A hybrid, at least the hybrids today, they're powered by gasoline or diesel. There'll be some diesel in the future. You don't plug a hybrid in, at least not the ones they build today. So the difference between a true electric car, battery-powered plug-in, is if you're on the Green Choice program, you can truly claim the energy that I'm driving on is coming from the West Texas wind. If you're driving any other kind of car, whether it's a hybrid or a regular gasoline-powered or diesel-powered vehicle, you cannot claim that. In fact, 
if you really think about it, since 60% of uh, America's oil, which is used to make gasoline, is imported, and the one part of the world which seems to have the least expensive, the easiest oil to get out of the ground is the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, other countries of the Persian Gulf, that's where the easy to get oil is. So that's where a lot of it's coming from. So you can only say your car is being powered by oil from wherever. But if you want to be able to say you're driving on the wind, the West Texas wind, and think of that Texas flag there, and that's how you're getting around, the only way to do that is, is a battery-powered all-electric car. And uh, this is not a pitch for any particular company because we don't sell them. But uh, keep your eyes open. In the coming years in Austin, there will be people selling all-electric battery-powered cars, factory-made, not homemade conversions like mine. But they'll be around, so keep your eyes open. And Mark Park, right under a street lamp today. So if you go out there, he'll pop the hood and see what it looks like. It's pretty cool. Why don't we take another online question here? Okay. This comes from uh, Sean. How has, how has deregulation affected renewable energy in Texas? In Houston, residents have committed to choose their energy supply. Are residents under deregulated areas chosen more green energy, such as Green Mountain, than non regulated areas? Well, largely because of companies such as Green Mountain, uh, several, uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's several hundred thousand customers who've had the choice have chosen renewable energy throughout Texas, and Green Mountain is the leading, I believe they, they are the leading um, independent company that is giving a renewable energy choice to customers. They're probably not the only ones, um, but they are... And I'm, I'm happy to give a pitch for Green Mountain because they're here in Austin, their headquarters. Not just their Texas headquarters, their national headquarters is in Austin. And we're very happy about that. So, and also, we don't compete with Green Mountain because Austin Energy, uh, according to the law which established deregulation, uh, is not required to enter into competition. But we do give our customers a choice. It's important to have a choice. The choice is green choice or conventional. So I uh, guess to answer the question, uh, we know that there are hundreds of thousands of customers in the uh, deregulated parts of Texas, such as Reliant and TXU and, and AEP, American Electric Power, who are choosing green over uh, conventional sources, which might cost somewhat less, but they prefer to pay the premium and see that more wind farms are developed. I think wind is Green Mountain's main energy source. Yep. Great. A couple more questions for Mark. Okay, one up at the top here. Um, I was wondering how nuclear energy in terms of cost compares to renewable energy sources. Okay, how does nuclear compare to renewable? Um, I didn't show nuclear on the bar chart. It's If you look only at the fuel, and again, I was trying to show for existing power sources look only at the fuel because we have the plants already. If you look only at the fuel cost of nuclear, it's, it's low, it's, it's, about, it's even lower than coal. However, the question would be really, are we considering building a new nuclear plant? And we're not. Austin is not considering it. The last time one was built, well, we know how much ours cost. Uh, it cost, a, <laughs> I don't remember the exact number, but it, it was... It's a very, it was a very, very high capital cost relative to any other kinds of power plants. But the fact that we're simply not looking at nuclear as a future resource means it's almost irrelevant what the cost would be compared to renewables because it's not under consideration. And it's been so long since the last nuclear plant was ordered, I'm not sure if anybody could say for sure what a nuclear plant would cost if one were built today. It's been, actually the last plant ordered was before Three Mile Island, which if I recall happened in 78. That probably before most of the people in this room were born. Only a few of us remember, <laughs> only a few of us remember Three Mile Island, right? There has not been a new nuclear plant ordered since 1978 in the United States. So, we don't know what they would cost for sure. I hope that answers your question. Yes? You mentioned 
mentioned that one way to use the biomass source of energy is to burn it. Can you comment on the emissions from burning? Emissions, uh, the question was one, one way to, to use a biomass source such as wood or a dedicated energy crop or a crop, what's called a crop residue. I didn't use that term before, but what's left in the field after you've harvested. One way is to burn it directly in a, in a specially designed boiler that's designed to burn that fuel. In some ways, it's cleaner than coal because there's less mercury. There's always less sulfur. And generally, the ash is, depends on the coal if you're comparing burning coal to burning, to burning biomass. Um, but it's clearly, you know, there, there's a concern. You need to have air pollution controls on a plant that burns biomass. A more sophisticated, a more refined way than to burn it is to turn it into a gas in a device called a gasifier first and then burn the gas. Uh, in fact, they've been looking at doing that with coal as well. And there are some plants which gasify either coal or biomass and then burn the relatively clean gas. That's much cleaner than burning it in a boiler by itself. However, it also costs more. And just one more point to make on that. Whereas if you're burning a hydrocarbon fuel that you've mined, whether it's uh, oil, coal, or natural gas, you're putting CO2 in the air, which previously was in the ground. If you're burning in a boiler a biomass fuel such as wood and you're growing trees at the same rate per year as you've burned the ones you've harvested or switchgrass or whatever other biomaterial, as long as you're growing it at the same rate to replenish the boiler, you're really not putting any net carbon dioxide in the air because you're absorbing it through the growing process at the same rate as you've emitted carbon dioxide. So there's a real big difference in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and the global warming impact, a real big difference between burning a fuel that's mined versus burning a substance which you grow, assuming you grow it at the same rate that you use it up. Good question. Uh, yes. Does Austin Energy ever plan to um, offer rebates in a program where you would have a uh, the solar panel, or not a solar panel, but a solar hot water heater, where you just have black tubes where the water goes through to supplement your hot water heater? Yeah. The question is, uh, do we think uh, do well we do we offer or will we offer a rebate for solar water heating? And we do. We have been offering it for years. It's just not very well known. It's up to $350 for a large residential solar water heating system as a rebate. And we also give low interest loans for people who want to buy solar water heaters. Uh, to my knowledge, only a few dozen people over the years that I'm aware we've looked at it have actually used that low interest loan or rebate for solar water heating. And uh, solar water heating if, especially if you have an all electric home and are using electricity to heat water and you use a fair amount of hot water or a lot of water, makes an awful lot of sense even before the rebates considered. So those of you who uh, are out there in, in cyberspace or here who are using electricity to heat your water and you take long showers or you've got lots of you have lots of people in the house who, who use a lot of hot water. If you're in an all electric building, look very carefully at it and uh, call up a solar water heating contractor, if you like, and get a price estimate or get a bid and do the calculation. You may find that even before considering the rebate and that we've again, we've been offering them solar water heating today makes a lot of sense. Now, if your gas, most people in Austin have gas service, not all. Even with gas, it depends. It may make sense today, but you'll have to do the calculation. And I, you know, it depends on the particular circumstance. Um, we have here, I guess, Dr. Gary Valit, who's a professor at the university, has a solar water heating system and a photovoltaic system on his home. And uh, since he's still here, I'm assuming he'd be happy to answer questions afterwards specifically about solar water heating because he is the solar professor um, who's trained 
decades of solar engineers in, in Austin who are now working all over the country. So let's see. One more question? Or uh, we we'll take one, one more? more, yeah. one more okay. On let's take one online and then one more. Okay. Um, which area of renewable energy has at this time most room for expansion? This comes from uh, someone who identifies themselves only as JP. Perhaps it's uh, Justin Timberlake. <laughs> that's very good. Well, Justin, uh, boy, that's a hard one. <laughs> um, they, they, they've all got room for improvement. Uh, wind wind has, has improved so much already, that, uh, but it's still, it's still improving, and it's improving by getting bigger, um, less expensive per unit. Probably photovoltaics, since we've seen some breakthroughs and real advancements in laboratories in making solar cell panels more efficient and less expensively than we're making them now, that probably has the greatest room for cost reductions. And solar thermal systems, there's also a lot of room there. It, it would be very hard to say which one is absolutely has the most room for in, improvements. Uh, of course, anything I say, I'm probably wrong. Or there'll be, there'll be a lot of contention between the proponents who really know the technologies and there's no agreement. Uh, I guess on this one, although I've just given my very tentative answer, I'm going to step back from that one and hedge and say they've all got tremendous potential. How's that? Okay. Thank you, Justin. <laughs> this gentleman over here has had his hand up for a while. Uh, what about rebates for photovoltaics on a home? Yeah. What about rebates for photovoltaics? We're working on the plan right now. In fact, we had a meeting this afternoon, and there'll be more meetings. There's an organization called Solar Austin, which um, is, is there anyone here from Solar Austin? Okay, they're they're a basically a group of uh, private citizens who are who are uh, interested in solar and, and has been working with us in the city council to uh, launch a rebate program for photovoltaics. It will probably be announced in late March, early April. And there'll be rebates for both homes, for residential systems, owner-occupied, I should point out, or commercial buildings. And the rebates will probably cover a substantial portion of the cost of the solar system. And uh, the plan is that we're going to start the program in April and continue it over the years in one form or another, uh, it may change over time, but there will be a rebate program. The way to learn about it, you can go to the AustinEnergy.com, www.AustinEnergy.com website. And uh, that's probably on the CD and it's on the webcast, I guess. Uh, that's where all the news gets, all, all the news about Austin Energy gets on that website. So you can keep track of that, particularly during the end of March, and look for the announcement. There'll also be announcements uh, in the Energy Plus newsletter, which goes out in everybody's electric bill. And that's another way we communicate with the public. So um, having said that, I once again want to thank ESI and Dr. Banner and Brian and all the others. And I forget all their names, but quite a few people worked on, uh, on uh, jazzing up this CD. Uh, and getting some animation in there and, and putting the whole thing together. And if there's anyone who I'm forgetting to thank, uh, please consider this thanks as well. So thank you very much for coming out. <laughs>